to question set three. So turning to the fact pattern of question one, question one reads, an attorney represented a telephone company in a suit against a customer for an unpaid telephone bill. The customer was not represented by an attorney. Soon after the filing of a formal lawsuit, the attorney contacted the customer and asked the customer if they wanted to engage in settlement discussions. The attorney stated that otherwise, his client instructed him to litigate the lawsuit against the customer. The attorney told the customer that he wants what is best for everyone, including you, and that the settlement could accomplish that goal. The attorney and the client entered into a fair settlement agreement. Is the attorney subject to discipline? So again, trying to assess the role that this question is testing, this question is specifically uh, testing how lawyers communicate and transact business with people that are not their clients, specifically the opposing party who is not being represented by another lawyer. Well, if you're representing someone and the person in which you are suing or you know the opposing party just generally doesn't have a lawyer or refuses to get a lawyer, you obviously have to be able to talk to them and to communicate with them. Um, so that is permissible. However, when you do talk and communicate with someone that is not your client, specifically the opposing party, you need to take care to first of all tell the person kind of your position and who you are and that you're not representing them. But secondly, you need to make sure that you do not appear disinterested in the matter. And what I mean by that is that the rules want to make it clear that you do have an interest in the matter. Why do you have an interest in the matter? Because you are being paid to represent a party to the matter. So here, when this lawyer spoke to this opposing party um, on behalf of his client, that was fine. But the issue here is that the fact pattern tells us the lawyer specifically stated he wants what's best for everyone, including you. And that does not appear very disinterested. Um, in fact, this lawyer should only want what's best for his client, not what is best for the opposing party. So that is the issue here with this communication. So revisiting the call to question, it says, is the attorney subject to discipline? And we would be looking for a yes answer. Something along the lines that this attorney has um, acted like he is disinterested. And of course, we know that he should be very interested because he's representing a party here. So turning to answer choice A, it says yes, because the attorney is not permitted to talk to an unrepresented party. So this is incorrect, because if someone is not represented, um, it's not that you can't speak to them. In fact, you would have to speak to them to try to settle the matter or try to communicate anything. So this is just wrong. Answer choice B says yes, because the attorney implied that he was disinterested in the matter. So B looks very good. In fact, B is identical to what we've been discussing. So let's hold on to answer choice B. Answer choice C says yes, because the attorney did not advise the customer to get a lawyer. So this is a, a, like a trap answer that I think a lot of people pick. C is incorrect because you do not have to advise someone to get a lawyer. Um, that is not accurate. It's just that you really shouldn't be giving legal advice to someone that's not your client. And if you are going to give someone legal advice, it should be to get a lawyer. So C is wrong. Answer choice D says no, since the attorney was being truthful and non-deceptive. And D um, is incorrect, and it's kind of using some language from a different rule. Um, and it's really missing the point that this lawyer appeared uh, disinterested here. So B is the correct answer. Moving on to question two. Question two says, an attorney agreed to represent a client in a lawsuit against a hospital. The attorney used a retainer form that he had printed off the internet, which stated that the form could be used for any personal or commercial use. The attorney's agreement with the client provides in part, the client agrees to pay the attorney's fee for services within 30 days after receipt of the attorney's bill. Further, the client agrees to release the attorney from all liability arising from the representation. The attorney told the client that the client should consult an independent lawyer prior to signing the agreement. However, the client decided not to do so and signed the agreement without consulting a lawyer. Is the attorney's retainer agreement with the client proper? So the rule that this question is testing is whether or not it's permissible for a lawyer to um, kind of prospectively limit um, his or her liability for malpractice. And under the ABA model rules, you can basically ask a prospective client or client to prospectively waive their malpractice claims, but the only way you can ethically do this is if your client is, in fact, independently represented by a different lawyer in entering into this agreement.
This is the only scenario under all of the rules in which your client must be represented by a different lawyer. So applying that to the facts here, we know that this client decided against hiring a different lawyer and signed the agreement anyways. So that's a problem. Revisiting the call to question, it asks, is the attorney's retainer agreement with the client proper? The answer to this is going to be no. No, because the lawyer is attempting to limit their liability for malpractice and the client is not independently represented by a different lawyer in entering into this agreement. So let's assess our answer choice options. A says yes, because the attorney advised the client to consult with independent counsel prior to signing the agreement. A is wrong, because like I just said, it's not enough to just advise your client to consult with different counsel, but they actually have to retain independent counsel, so A is wrong. B says yes, because there's sufficient consideration for the agreement. Uh, B is incorrect, it's just kind of off base, this is not a contracts question, and it's missing the rule that's being tested. C says no, because the attorney used a form he printed from the internet. Um, again, this kind of misses the point. Um, it's kind of like a red herring in this fact pattern. What this is testing is his ability to enter into this type of agreement with the client, not necessarily where he got the agreement from. D says no, because the attorney is attempting to limit his liability for malpractice. D is the correct answer. Question number three. An attorney represented a plaintiff in a complicated medical malpractice case. The attorney was having a difficult time proving part of her case and was unsure how to proceed. The attorney asked another associate at the firm for assistance. The associate had a lot of experience with medical malpractice cases. The attorney identified the client by name and described the entire case to the associate. The associate was able to adequately assist the attorney. The client was not charged more for the associate's assistance. Was it proper for the attorney to consult with her associate? So what rule is this question testing? This question is testing the lawyer's ability to basically talk about a client matter with other lawyers in his or her firm. And we know, based upon our rule of confidentiality, that lawyers are allowed to share confidential information with other lawyers in their firm, assuming that their client has not restricted this information. Here we don't have any facts that illustrate that this client has basically told the lawyer special instructions about who can or can't have information regarding their case. Instead, these facts simply tell us that the lawyer uh, sought help from another coworker. Is this permissible? And the answer is yes, uh, this is totally permissible. A lawyer does not have to get his or her client's consent to do this. Um, in fact, I would go so far to say that when people hire a law firm, usually it's presumed that maybe multiple attorneys are going to be handling your matter. And in fact, that's why a lot of people like large law firms that are high power, uh, because they have a lot of power managing and handling their case. So turning back to our call to question, it says, was it proper for the attorney to consult with her associate? We're looking for a yes answer because we know that lawyers in a law firm are allowed to help each other out on client matters. So A says no because the attorney told the associate the name of the client. Um, a is incorrect because not only can this lawyer tell the other lawyer the name of her client, but she can tell her a heck of a lot more than that. She can share confidential information with her coworker. So A is missing the point here and A is wrong. B says no if the client's consent was not previously obtained. B is wrong because you do not need your client's consent to talk about a client matter with other lawyers in your firm. C says yes, because the attorney and her associate work in the same law firm. So B looks pretty good. Again, it illustrates this implied authorization to talk to other lawyers in your firm. So let's hold on to answer choice C. And then D says yes, but only if the client was notified of the associate's assistance in the matter. Um, again, D is incorrect because we do not even have to tell the client that other people handled the matter. You don't need consent. You don't have to notify them. Uh, that is not what the rule requires. So the correct answer here is C.